Thanks, Lou. And thanks, Foresight. Uh, thanks so much, Foresight, for hosting uh, such a great event. Um, so I wanted, before I get into the subject matter here, uh, just ask a few kind of uh, framing questions. Uh, how many of you here in the room uh, would describe yourselves as being people who do machine learning or statistics for computer programming? Can I see hands? So about, maybe about half of you. And then how many of you uh, would describe yourselves as either working uh, on the criminal justice system or kind of having some close exposure or experience with it? Maybe about a third of you. Okay, that will help me uh, like calibrate where I should spend a little more time on detail yeah. and where people will follow. Maybe we can ask who has been um, in the criminal system? Has anyone been in the US or, or a different? System. We've seen three people, at least three, four people who have uh, perhaps either been incarcerated or otherwise been uh, entangled with it. And that makes this room a little unusual uh, compared to the surrounding world. Fewer of us uh, have been uh, involved in this uh, giant apparatus than uh, you know, the, the proportion of the surrounding society that we live in. Because um, that number is so high. The last question I have is, how many of you have seen Minority Report? <laughs> All right, we're not quite living there, but we are surprisingly close. Um, so just before I get into the subject, um, uh, let me tell you a little bit about PEI, the Partnership on AI, the organization I work for. Uh, I, I worked for uh, EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, for many years. I was the chief computer scientist there. Uh, and then last year, I took a job at the Partnership on AI uh, as Director of Research, um, which is this multidisciplinary organization created by Google, Facebook, Micro Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, uh, IBM, uh, basically the heads of the, the AI labs of those big tech companies. But they worked with the ACLU, with EFF, um, with Amnesty International, uh, more futurist organizations like the Future of Life Institute and the Future of Humanity Institute, uh, academic research labs, um, to create uh, an organization that they wanted to have uh, in existence to help answer questions about the relationship between humanity and artificial intelligence. Um, and importantly, nothing I say tonight uh, should be taken as representing the views of those uh, uh, organizations that are in the partnership. Except insofar as occasionally I'll say, well, look, here's the thing we reached in our big haggling process, in which case it still doesn't represent the views of individual uh, members necessarily, but may kind of be taken as a collective perspective of the entire AI research community. So I took that job, and right before I took it, like, you know, sort of as I was saying yes, California passed a piece of legislation, state legislation called SB10, which mandated that every county in the state of California must purchase and use uh, algorithmic risk assessment tools to decide on whether to detain or release every single criminal defendant in the state. An astonishing thing to have happen. Um, that legislation um, does something uh, very good and important, which is to abolish the money bail system in the state of California. But at the same time, it, it has this mandate for statistical risk assessment tools, requires that those things produce high, medium, or low risk scores um, for every criminal defendant. Um, the, the definition of what those scores mean is decided by a panel under the legislation. Humans remain somewhat in the loop. Um, this legislation, though it's passed, is not yet in force. And I'll tell you a little bit about where it's at procedurally, very complicated, uh, later. But uh, it basically has this complicated flowchart that it creates about how the, the algorithms interact with human decision making. You know, if you get a high risk score, you go to order a detain, but if you're medium, you get it's complicated. Uh, if you're low risk, you might get released automatically. Um, if you, you might wonder, well, what are these risk assessment tools? These are not high tech AI. Uh, they basically involve filling out um, a form, uh, having a sort of a, a corrections officer fill out this form with lots of questions. You know, how many times have you been sentenced to jail for 30 days or more? Um, how many times has your probation been revoked? Um, uh, some very personal questions like have, you know, your family members being incarcerated, people around you, victims of crime. Um, have you ever been a gang member? 
uh, etc. So, so sometimes a long list of questions like this, sometimes a much uh, shorter list, just your arrest record and your age and kind of a couple of things like that, um, depending on which ex exact risk assessment tool you're talking about. And then at the end, you, you have a very simple logistic regression model or uh, heuristic model even that spits out this, this score. So this is a type of artificial intelligence that actually uh, looks a lot like actuarial tables. And in fact, these things date back from before the existence of computers. The first systems like this were uh, developed in the 1920s. And so it's a kind of astonishing realization like, oh, humans have been trying to build automated decision-making systems uh, for a long time. And it's only now in the moment when we're thinking carefully about what we're doing with artificial intelligence that to some extent we're going back and thinking carefully about things we were doing beforehand. Um, so you've got this, um, you've got this scorecard, and it spits out a prediction, which confusingly can be either the probability that you will be rearrested in some period of time, uh, if in the in a pretrial setting like we've got in California during the time you're waiting for your your uh, court date, or sometimes the probability that you'll fail to show up for a court date. Totally a different thing. It happens for different reasons, uh, but these tools are very unclear and vague about which of, of those things they're predicting in some cases, not all of them. Now, before we talk more about this uh, mess uh, of these risk assessment tools and what's wrong with them and, and whether you could ever conceivably fix them, um, I need to say a little bit more about the context. And Lou was getting at some of this. Uh, but here is a graph. I, I'm, I'm a, the kind of person who thinks well in graphs, and maybe uh, many of you are as well. This is a graph of the incarceration rate in the United States over time. It starts with 1925 here. And you go along and you get to a, like about 1972 and then something weird happens. Uh, suddenly you see this precipitous rise in incarceration rates and they rise by about a factor of five. And they start maybe in the last few years to dip downwards again, but just slightly. And then if you look at kind of where this nets out, um, this is a comparison of the, the incarceration rates, you know, number of people in prison uh, or jail uh, per head of population. This red bar here is the United States today. This orange bar here is California today. So California is much better than um, the United States as a whole. Uh, there are other states that are actually way out over, over here off the graph. Places like Louisiana, uh, the deep south, you get incarceration rates that are just wildly high. Um, these green bars that look nothing like the US are the OECD countries. So, so no developed countries um, uh, look anything like the US. And, and if you, you look at that list in detail, you also see that, say, English-speaking countries are all like way up, you know, well, way up here. Maybe New Zealand is the worst of the English-speaking countries. Uh, and then you have places like Iceland, Japan, um, that have uh, maybe one-tenth of the U.S. incarceration rate. Uh, this line here is interesting. This is California, uh, 1960. So, uh, and it's a slight underestimate because th there are no local um, uh, incarceration numbers. It's all state and federal <laughs> in that number. So maybe, maybe California was a little up here. But you, what we see is that um, something aberrant is still profoundly going on in the United States. Incarceration is way too high relative to historical baselines and relative to international baselines. And this is the setting that we are, we are existing in, and if, if you're an activist or a reformer or an AI expert, this is the, this, the situation we might be trying to fix. Now, why the hell did this happen? I, and I have up here on the screen uh, a quotation about the origins of this phenomenon. Uh, and I want to like, highlight, I, I'm only 70% sure that this quote can be trusted um, as a, a, a story about these events. Uh, and this is a quote from uh, a, a gentleman named John Ehrlichman, um, who served time uh, as one of the White, uh, the White House plumbers uh, who broke into Watergate and served in the Nixon administration. So he was in the middle of uh, the administration at the time. And when asked by a journalist in the 90s, and it's important to note, so this is, you know, Elfman's dead, a journalist after he died reported this conversation that they'd had in, in the early 90s. So Dan Baum asked Ehrlichman, like, you know, why did you start the war on drugs? He said, the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies. 
The anti-war left are black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black. But by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, <laughs> and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. So this is the most diabolical and dark assessment of how on earth the United States got into its current situation. I, don't, I think it's, some of this is verifiable and some of this is a story that we can look at and say, well, maybe this is partially true. Um, in fact, there was something else also going on. The, the causes were more complicated. This is a graph of the crime rate in the United States. Uh, actually, I guess the crime rate in California specifically here um, over that time. And what you see is that the crime rate was actually wildly higher as well in those Nixon administration years. Uh, something caused this. In fact, this pattern of higher crime wasn't unique to the United States. It was global. Uh, and so this is now, I'm just going to give you my personal opinion, having uh, studied this question a little bit and read, you know, 20, 30, 40 papers about it, is that mass incarceration in the United States was a political consequence of some combination of causes that included the great crime wave I just showed you, the Nixon administration and that agenda we, we heard reported, um, a backlash against psychedelic culture, which had emerged as a loud voice in this city, uh, most of all, but across the United States, and which was pretty troubling as a phenomenon in the United States at the time, and a backlash against the civil rights movement that had just succeeded in winning uh, a whole lot of activist battles in the South. Uh, and that great crime wave, which is one of those causes, was probably caused by some combination, and we don't yet know what the combination was, of generational effects. And it's hard to pin those down. Maybe they were cultural, maybe it was post-war for parents who were who had PTSD from World War II, maybe there's something else that people haven't understood yet, and lead exposure. So there were way more cars on the road um, in the middle of the 20th century, and they all spewed lead out, uh, and there's very strong, consistent evidence from the United States and many other places that children exposed to lead are more impulsive, have more trouble learning, um, and have other behavioral problems, and, and this could be a significant uh, cause for that generational effect, potentially. Not fully established. Again, epistemic confidence here is around 70%. And along the way, strikingly, many of the politicians and economists and uh, administrators who were making the decisions that led to this phenomenon of mass incarceration thought they were taking the right steps to solve real problems. Uh, I don't think that this was all malice of the sort that Ehrlichman is claiming. I think a lot of people thought that crime was a serious emergency and or drugs were a serious emergency and you had to do something about them and that uh, incarceration was part of the solution. But when you step back and look at the consequences, you see something crazy, which is that the incarceration rate in the United States, this curve here, and the crime rate, I guess this is again California, these things look incredibly like each other as curves, but shifted by 20 years. So it was almost as though policy responses were enacted in the 70s with the war on drugs and in the 80s with tough on crime and the 90s with tough on crime, uh, the Clinton crime bill, that were punishing people for the crimes of, of a generation before. It just took that long to enact those laws and, and, and roll out those policies, and then it took that long to realize they were no longer needed and to start to bend the curve back down again here. Um, so this is a crazy uh, thing to realize, and if you do public policy work, it's probably a thing to watch for, that institutional processes can be way too slow and mistargeted at the phenomena that they're trying to address. So that's the backstory. Let's talk for a moment longer about where we are in California with mandates for AI and our criminal justice system. Uh, and the, the thing I'll just say about this, I shouldn't have even had all this stuff on this slide because it's so complicated. The situation with SB, the SB 10 legislation is, in, in California is really complicated. Um, there is now a widespread understanding in the United States that there's a huge problem with mass incarceration. Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, is probably the single like act uh, like of activism that, that made the biggest difference there, but it's part of a larger uh, like intellectual project within the academy to understand what happened. Uh, and to start documenting it clearly and figuring out what to do about it. And there is now bipartisan will for reform. 
at least the more libertarian wing of the Republican Party is, is on board with a program of reducing incarceration. And perhaps not least because paying a huge amount for prisons, public and private, is just a waste of taxpayers' money. <laughs> um, and punishing people for their choices of recreational substances is potentially terrible policy. And so there are some uh, legislators on the, on the Republican side of US politics who are willing to work with Democrats to reform the system. There's been a big push for evidence-based policy making. So moving from a, a system that defines crime as something that needs to be treated punitively to saying, well, look, crime is a phenomenon and you need to assess whether the interventions you're making against it are effective uh, and figure out which ones to use and how much to use them. And it's actually that push for evidence-based policy making that maybe 10, 15 years ago started to result in increased deployment. People dusting off these ideas from the, the 1920s or the 1970s and using uh, automated formulae for, for, for um, incarceration, for, for sentences or, or detention, and, and, and promoting those as an answer to mass incarceration. So the risk assessment tools, AI were not part of the, the problem. They were actually introduced as part of the solution, though it remains to be seen whether they're really helping. In California, there was a, and actually nationwide, there's been a specific reform objective for many criminal justice reformers of fixing pretrial detention. Because the phenomenon of being locked up while you wait for a trial turns out to stack the deck against criminal defendants in all sorts of ways. If you are behind bars and you can't afford a lawyer and people to run around and manage your defense for you, you get like an hour or two a week in the, in the prison library. And that's it. Uh, and you're in a really unpleasant, awful situation. Like being inside, I mean, I, I have thankfully never been inside a jail. Those of you who have been can probably tell some stories. But you're in this terrible situation that you really want to get out of, which means that a prosecutor is in a great position to say, look, just regardless of whether you're actually guilty or not, plead to time served, like plead to the charge, um, you'll get time served, we'll let you out. Or, or we'll keep you in front of the week and then let you out of whatever it is, they get their numbers, where they get to say they, they prosecuted a certain number of felonies and the system keeps moving. Uh, and so pretrial detention as a phenomenon is in general wildly unjust. It stacks the deck against the victims of this wildly over-incarcerative system. So reformers have really targeted it as a priority. Was, is that the best, the best priority? I, I'm not sure. And then within pretrial reform, people have gone off to money bail because uh, in a lot of parts of the United States, uh, and uniquely really compared to other parts of the world, in order to get let out uh, prior to trial, you often have to post your $2,000, $5,000, $20,000, whatever it is, some amount of money that for a lot of criminal defendants is just absurdly large compared to their incomes and their, their, their financial means. And so that drives them into the hands of uh, of bail bondsmen who are essentially like loan sharks. So now criminal defense, they acquired one serious problem of not being, <laughs> being behind bars, not being able to work, not being able to defend themselves. Then they get uh, introduced to a, um, a bail bondsman and now they have another problem as well. So reformers have gone after this money bail uh, mechanism in specific as a, an especially uh, unjust uh, part of the system. Um, and a reform coalition spent several years in California lobbying uh, for, for a version of SB 10 that would just abolish money bail. That bill, that proposal was re effectively rewritten by a body called the Judicial Council, which is the body of judges in the state of California, who eventually said, okay, we'll get rid of money bail, but we, we want something else to replace it uh, and to help us manage the enormous workload of all these people we have in the system. So we're going to require these automated tools to help us um, replace that decision-making tool with a different one and manage our workload. Uh, and so that that rewrite happened and then the bill passed almost immediately because the judges are clearly like very influential in Sacramento. Um, and the current state is total mayhem because civil liberties groups are litigating in general over the phenomenon of pretrial detention in California. And if those cases succeeded, it might be the case that SB 10 was no longer such a problem. 
Um, other parts of the political system in, in Sacramento want to consider amending legislation to see fix the mandates in various ways. And then the bail bonds industry that is going to be put out of business if these, uh, if these uh, uh, reforms go through has put up a ballot measure uh, that would repeal SB 10. And in order to do that, they went around and said ACLU uh, opposes this legislation, so stand with ACLU uh, in signing this petition. ACLU, I, I actually, there's an important detail that the coalition of organizations that had supported SB 10 initially splintered and went all sorts of different ways once it was amended to require these risk assessment tools. Um, ACLU, part of that went to opposing the legislation, but then wound up skewed because if SB 10 is repealed, bail bonds are back, and the ballot measure has the side effect of freezing legislation in the future around this area of law. So you wouldn't be able to pass new legislation to abolish bail bonds. So it's conceivable that you could have opposed SB 10 and then also oppose its repeal. So this is all inside baseball, it's incredibly complicated, but we are, we're gonna have a ballot measure um, in 2020 on what to do with this legislation, and probably understanding all of this crazy context is actually quite important um, for us as a community to make a decision about what we're gonna do with it. <coughs> but this is not AI. Let's get back to AI. The stakes here are super high. Um, around 65,000 people are in pretrial detention in California each night. Um, the total number per year, of course, is harder to calculate, probably hundreds of thousands, because some people are in for one night, some people for many, and there's enormous procedural and direct harm. If you ever want to do AI ethics works, this seems like a really important place to start. Um, you don't want to be deploying machine learning and statistical models in a context like this without having thought really carefully about what the hell you're doing. And in fact, there's considerable evidence that the people who've made these risk assessment tools didn't think very carefully about what they were doing. We didn't think in the right way. Uh, so this is a report by ProPublica from 2016 uh, that studied uh, the scores emitted by North Point Compass, now called Equivant Compass, which is one of the most popular risk assessment tools, um, showing that there um, is enormous apparent bias of a certain sort in these tools. We'll talk about what that sort is exactly. In order to do this study, the reporters at ProPublica had to get a data set. There were none available, so they used Freedom of Information Act requests in Broward County in Florida to get a data set that was like a black box version of what the risk assessment tool was doing. They didn't get to see the internal survey information uh, about it, but they could see the people going in and the scores being emitted on the outside. Um, and what they saw uh, were, was pat were patterns like, uh, you know, here's one example, this woman who'd um, uh, been given four misdemeanors for stealing a tricycle uh, with rated high risk as an eight. She happened to be African-American. Um, this other, uh, 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 man who had committed two armed robberies and one attempted armed robbery uh, was rated as a three. When he was released, he uh, committed grand theft again. So you can see in isolation human stories that look wacky. Um, there are lots of these. And then at the aggregate level, what you saw was a massive disparity in false positive rates. So if you were um, uh, African-American and um, not going to reoffend, your risk of being labeled as high risk was way higher. So the system was making adverse incarcerate decisions against African Americans at almost twice the rate um, that it was making them about uh, white Americans. So that, that by a certain <laughs> mathematical definition, not the legal definition, looks like wildly disparate impacts uh, and injustice, unjust decision making um, in this kind of system. It turned out that the people making this tool had thought about bias and tried to correct it, but they defined bias differently than the way it's, the fairly obvious way that it's measured here. They were trying to ensure that the tool was equally accurate for all people um, in all different categories. And as a side effect of that, they wound up with a system that worked like this. Um, and that turned out to, this research, uh, this paper and the data set that was released turned out to, to spawn an enormous and very complicated research literature on these questions like that. We'll talk a little bit more about it later. Um, but this, is, this was the context where, when I started at PEI, 
Uh, and we had a mandate to try to tackle AI ethics, ethics questions. Um, this seemed like an extremely important place to start. So we, as soon as I started that job last year, I started gathering uh, the civil society organizations and the tech companies and the AI community in a room and saying, what do we think about uh, this California mandate, about the wider use of these tools, which is happening all across the United States, um, and I, about the underlying questions of this kind of application of machine learning. And what we found was that some partners were very strongly opposed to the risk assessments. Um, and they were just, you know, oh my god, what the hell, we can't use AI for this, it's totally irresponsible. A second step had a nuanced spin on that. These were actually organizations that had been heavily involved in, in criminal justice reform. And they were saying, you can't, you, we shouldn't use them to detain people, but it's okay to use these things to release people. You can make a flowchart and have low risk go to release, but you can't have the high risk thing go to detain, it has to go to human decision making, which was an interesting, nuanced, surprising sense. Um, and then there was a third group of people who said, actually, we think that you should be able to get these things to work. And we're like, what do you mean? And they said, well, better work better than uh, human decision makers. So the alternative is that the decision gets made by a judge and judges are human and fallible and very biased too. And so the standard is not, is this thing fair, but is it more fair than a judge? And though we agree the current thing, the current tools look really biased, maybe we could fix them. <coughs> and so um, we were confronted by this really divergent set of views and had to figure out, is there a shared position that the AI community can come to? One thing we really noticed was the difference in baselines for comparison were really important. So, the people who are optimists about the use of AI were saying, you can do better than judges. And the people who are pessimists and sophisticated about it were saying, oh, maybe you could, but with that much effort, you could just reform the system in some human way, and we should do that instead. And so we were, um, we were seeing these, these pretty sophisticated views. There are some people who are saying, Look, in theory, you could do this, but the statistics, like the data sets aren't good enough and the, the predictions aren't good enough. And so you'd need to have way better predictions. Um, so we tried to form a unified stance across all of these differing views. And what we came up with was a set of requirements that everyone agreed you would conceptually need to meet if, you, if it were to be appropriate to use an AI system for something as, as um, serious as putting someone behind bars. And people disagreed about whether they thought those requirements could ever be met. There were 10 of them, and they were about fixing bias in the data sets, and then separately fixing bias in the models, and then about not confounding multiple types of predictions, um, and then making sure that the, the, the risk predictions were interpretable and explainable. Um, then about providing error bars, confidence levels on predictions, because it's one thing to say someone's like 60% risk, but like, is that, is that for sure 60% or do you mean like it might be 20% and it might be 90%? Um, uh, provide training to the clerks and judges that would use these tools so they understood what, how terrible they were and how, you know, how janky a piece of, of statistics they were using. Um, uh, ensure that where there were pu important public policy choices about the trade-offs involved in the criminal justice system, they won't be bur being buried in some piece of software and then actually um, legislators would be accountable for that uh, set of choices. And um, openness, we shouldn't have reporters at ProPublica using Freedom of Information Act requests to figure out how this is happening. We should have published data sets, models, and codes so the research community can study them. Um, uh, the data should be kept around for replicability and contestability, and there should be thorough post-deployment -eval post evaluation of the consequences of using this kind of uh, technology. So that was the list, and I can talk, how are we doing for time here? Oh, great. All right, so I can talk in much more detail about some of these, and I think this will be interesting. Yeah. So let's talk about requirement one, about the data sets themselves not being biased. Um, so data is biased for a number of different reasons, but one of the most um, uh, fundamental is that the samples you get are not representative of the underlying phenomenon. You know, we have arrest data, a conviction data, and that's not the same as an oracle, a crystal ball that tells you what crimes were 
Um, and so if you are going to make predictions about crime in the future, you need a way to know that you've actually measured crime in the past to predict from. And given that you can't do that, that all of your sources of data are biased, you know, it's information about the behavior of police arresting people and police stop people in different places at different times at different rates. Um, uh, you need to reweight that data in some way. And then you need to know that you reweighted it correctly. You need some way of telling that as you adjust all the sliders on your data set, that what you got at the end was meaningful. Uh, this is crazily hard because um, different groups of people we know are stopped at different rates in the United States. Um, the color of your skin and your gender massively predicts <coughs> that. Um, they're searched at different rates. They're arrested at different rates, charged at different rates, convicted at different rates, and wrongfully convicted at different rates. And so if you just train your, your, your model to predict arrest patterns, you're replicating the structural bias in policing in the United States. And it's even crazier than that because it's so different from city to city and precinct to precinct. So some departments may be relatively fair and others may be super biased or in fact just make up their data, which is also a problem. So you think you're training a model from data about the world, but actually um, uh, people's salaries or whether they hit their promotion targets depended on some numbers and they started making them up, uh, which happens. So you've got really terrible data, it's, it's super biased. Um, and so before you go and train a model, you need to figure out what to do about this. Um, uh, we actually may do a project to try to figure out whether you could reweight uh, arrest data in the United States to measure crime. That would involve using second and third sources of data, like surveys of victims of crime and thorough census surveys where you ask people indirectly, did you, you know, ever do something that actually was a crime? You try and measure the differences in those different data sets and sort of correct some giant complicated, do a maximum likelihood estimation on a model of crime. And at the end, you get out some error bars. And you know, those error bars may be so large that you look at this and say, wait, okay, we're done. Or it may be, okay, it's, you know, this is the start of a sound methodology for, for solving this problem. But this is a huge amount of unsolved statistical work that hasn't happened yet. Um, there are other just horrifying problems with this data. So if you go and look at the tools and look at the data they were trained on, it's data from typically like the 2000s or the 1990s even, which means it's data from the, like, the time when that great crime wave mm -hmm. was still happening in full force. And it, as machine learning people, we know, oh, you retrain your model every month or every year, or like all the time. Uh, in this field, the people who are making these predictions haven't retrained in a decade or two. In some cases, they can't retrain because they no longer have the data that they had because they were contractually obligated to delete it once they built their model. Um, and this has immediate consequences because, for instance, I should have put this in the graph, juvenile crime in the United States has been tumbling faster than crime in general. Young people don't commit crimes at the rates they did in the 90s or the 80s or the 70s. And that means that the model that isn't retrained picks on young people completely unfairly in 2019. Um, also, these data sets include marijuana arrests. And so if you're predicting crime based on whether a person was arrested for marijuana possession in the past, and you're in a state where marijuana is no longer illegal, what are you doing? Um, so fixing this is getting to step zero on whether you could actually make reasonable predictions. The next problem is even though you, you know, there's actually a mis misperception, a misconception that a lot of people have that if you've got clean, unbiased data, then you can have a non-biased model. And I'll show you why that's not the case in a moment. Um, or another misconception, which is that if you take race out of the data set, so you don't have a variable for race, or then you can't be bar like biased on race. You don't have a variable for gender, you can't be biased on gender, you'll be fair under those circumstances. So if, um, fairness through unawareness of a characteristic about people. Um, both of these things just turn out to be completely false, and I'll show you why. It's a little subtle. 
Um, and then for those of you who are machine learning people, there's a third misconception, which is, well, there are 25 different versions of definitions of fairness, so how can we pick one to use? Um, I, I don't think that means you should pick none of the definitions, or that they're all equally plausible. So to explain why, just taking um, something like race out of a, um, out of a prediction um, doesn't fix things, um, I need to introduce an idea called omitted variable bias. So up here on, on this, the board, I have an example of a data set that you might train a prediction model on. So here, you know, people's names or you know, blinded names uh, uh, in this first column, then a characteristic like age, you know, gender, uh, their uh, arrest history, sorry, the arrest history here, the current crime that they're charged with here, and then some outcome, because uh, this is a past data set of what happened with people when they were released, were they re-arrested or not re-arrested in some amount of time. Um, this, so the phenomenon I was talking about before of, of sampling bias is essentially that the rows of this enormous, this, this thing would be much bigger, it would be thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of rows ideally. The rows are not statistically representative of the distribution in the real world. The second problem of omitted variable bias is to do with the fact that you're missing some columns that you needed. In order to successfully predict um, the true distribution of outcomes, you might have needed something like uh, testosterone levels. That might have been very relevant to whether people were going to reoffend, or uh, whether someone had access to good role models. Um, or a supportive community or housing when they were released. All this stuff is missing, and so what you get is omitted variable bias. Um, now, how is it that omitted variable bias, which is this very abstract mathematical thing, can turn into a practical problem for certain groups of people? Well, let me show you. Here's an example. I suppose that I would try to make a, an insurance prediction. I have some drivers, and they, I need to predict their odds of being in a car accident. Um, so what I measure is something like how often they drive at night. And then I predict from that how likely they are to be in an accident. What I see is that people who drive at night more often are more likely to be in accidents. Great, so I charge them higher premiums. But I, what I didn't have in there were these two variables, that, these two columns I might have collected. One of them is the frequency at which you drive to parties. Uh, and if you drive to parties, that also tends to cause more often that you drive with some blood in your alcohol. Maybe above the legal limit, maybe below. But either way, it, it contributes to accident risk. And so there's a, a kind of a causal mechanism here, which maybe is reasonable. But there's another group of people over here who work night shifts. And those people are going to get lumped in statistically with the people who drive to parties. And so if we just train a model with this observation to predict accident risk, it's going to be unfairly biased against night shift work. And so this is omitted variable bias. And it's exactly the same thing that we should always expect to occur uh, in any complex prediction, like the prediction of crime. Um, so what do we do about this? I mean, we made a recommendation based on the imperfect complexity of this question, which is pick. Is it okay, or do you want to at the end? Sure. Um, so back with that, the bad thing that we don't want to happen is the um, accident. And so it's talking about, was the person drunk and therefore about an accident or driving at night and at greater risk. Um, can, you, can you connect this metaphor with um, the missing variables? So like what, the, the accident presumably would be parallel to like the crime occurring. What we want to know is for a given person, you know, how safe is it to have them on the road? So we can make a choice, you know, in the criminal justice setting about whether to detain them if, if they're extremely dangerous or release them otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, state by state, the basis for detention is different. Sometimes it's flight risk. But, um, uh, so we want to predict, is this person dangerous? And what we find is we make predictions, at a, you know, some ac level of accuracy, and somehow those predictions are unfair to some group of people. They predict systematically at risks that are too high for the night shift workers. And that's because we didn't measure either night shifts work or frequency of driving to parties, which would have disentangled. If we measured either of these, you'd be able to tell um, the difference between these two groups of people. Um, but because we've measured neither, the model has to lump them together and make a, sh a joint prediction of um, both categories of people.
And so you see the same thing happening uh, with variables like, I mean, the example I gave of testosterone. Testosterone is hugely predictive of violent crime. Um, it's a little creepy to think that we might want to measure it, but if you did want to make a fair prediction, say, over gender, instead of predicting based on gender, you want to predict on testosterone levels, uh, which are much more than the <laughs> of that. Um, so what do you do about this? It turns out that there, is, there are solutions proposed in the literature. So there's one type of algorithm which people call like an equal opportunity algorithm that says, look, um, uh, regardless of what category you're in, if you're male or female, of different ethnicities, your odds of being released if you are not going to reoffend should be equal. And that would produce wildly different predictions than the, um, the ones that are currently being made and there are algorithms for doing this, they're just not being used. So either do that, or do something like the calibration mechanism where you try to make the prediction equally accurate for different groups, which is a very different thing to do. Um, gets different results, but less fair potentially uh, in the, the uh, disparate impact sense. Or do something like study the causal graphs and say, look, in this graph, like this chain of prediction is permitted, but this one's not. And you can build models, and you know, there are techniques, algorithms for doing that too. Pick one of these three things and make sure you're doing one of these three, and then measure how well you did by the other two measures. And if any of those measures is really off, you're not ready. You don't have a good enough prediction. You need to go back and add more columns of data to your prediction or fix, fix your, your training data sources so that you can get a prediction that isn't by some important measure wildly unfair. So that was our recommendation there. Um, do not confound multiple predictions. It's totally inappropriate to treat flight risk and failure to appear, which are different things, um, as the same as, as risk of reoffending. And yet, that's ex exactly what the California legislation does. Um, it, it says you can predict either the risk of failing to appear in court or the risk of pub like public safety. No like clarification about the relationship and minimize bias. These things are just munched together in a completely uh, uh, incoherent way. So really, you need to be very clear. Are you predicting recidivism? In which case, if it, the risk is very high and it's a violent crime, then maybe detention is appropriate. If it's not violent crime, maybe it's not. If you're, if you're predicting failure to appear, is it intentional flight, in which case detention is appropriate? Or is it like that someone might be homeless and really bad at keeping a calendar um, or that they might uh, have a job that they need to go to so they can't like just take a day off work to go to court or they might have uh, like transport problems in which case giving them a lift um, to the court would be way more effective than throwing them in jail. Um, so just be super clear about that and currently none of this is. Uh, requirement four, um, uh, provide an interpretable explanation so the humans are setting them know when to ignore them. Um, provide error bars. This is a, a super complicated statistical problem. Again, uh, you could try bootstrapping. For those of you who know what bootstrapping is, it's where you throw away some of your data and see how much the prediction changes. Um, that lets you tell if your data set is too small or dragged around by, by outliers. Um, you can do different definitions of fairness and say what's the highest prediction of risk on, on any definition of fairness and the lowest and use those as error bars. Or you could do this complicated thing I was referring to beforehand, um, where you simulate crime from different sources and estimate across that your error bars. No one had really grappled with this before, but probably you need to do all three at once um, to get sound error bars for these predictions. Um, train the judges. Uh, figure out, like, are we actually punishing people just to send a message to them or because, you know, uh, like, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth? Or are we actually trying to reduce crime in the future, in which case, whoa, maybe we have totally different um, set of objectives. In fact, those thresholds for high, medium, and low, maybe we should setting, be setting them with a target that ensures that California's incarceration rate goes back down here. And we, we actually maybe want to have a statewide target that is right there relative to crime. Assuming crime stays, stays at this level, incarceration has to go down. And so we, we might try to use these tools to drive incarceration down. But if that's what we're doing, we actually need to do that. 
um, which is very different than sort of stumbling into this uh, backwards. Um, open the code and the data, keep records, um, do randomly controlled trials of the consequences of the deployment of this AI stuff all over the, the country and figure out what it's doing. Um, and then grapple with a bunch of unanswered philosophical questions that just have been glossed over here. Is it fair to judge people not by things about them as individuals, but by uh, their kind of demographic characteristics? You're a young man at the age of 22 who grew up in this type of community and who's had like two arrests for burglary. Okay, we now have a prediction of the path in life that you're on, and we're going to roll that out in a structural way. Um, do we want to be in, live in that kind of society? In all fairness to this, you know, to these risk assessment tools, that's perhaps also what judges are doing, because they only see defendants for like a tiny amount of time, and if we really wanted to have a fairer assessment of where individual humans are at in their lives, we'd probably need a different system than the overworked and adversarial one we have right now. Um, how do we move from instantaneous prediction, like this person, what, what are their odds of reoffending in the next month, to something that's longer term? It says, well, is throwing this person in jail going to increase or decrease the risk that they commit another crime in the next five years or 10 years or 15 years? Probably going to increase the risk that they commit crime, except in very rare cases where people are really you know, sociopathic <laughs> and extremely violent. Um, so, Maybe we should be providing housing or jobs or community assistance instead. Um, those might, we should measure the consequences and figure out which prediction is actually the helpful one. But um, that isn't on the table because all of these decisions are being made inside courts and criminal justice parts of jurisdictions that don't have a budget and mission to do social services and mental health provision and housing provision. And so even though these problems are entangled, our policy making trying to view crime and, uh, and criminal justice as separable and separate from this other set of questions. And so I don't think until we've got better answers to these questions that we're going to get good outcomes on this front. So that's all I have for you, and uh, thank you all for listening. Uh, let's get into the discussion. Thank you, that was so good. Uh, you covered so much ground, uh, and it was really very cool. Um, I'm, I really want to ask you a few questions. And uh, first, you, I mean, I really appreciated the part where you explained like, how it was a difficult ethical debate uh, inside the partnership in the AI. And um, I wanted to know if, um, what was the sort of, how did it sit toward the question of, whether it is ever um, ethical to have an AI make a, such a decision, or whether it can always be an ethical decision that is being made if you're making it in the context of a system that's as deeply unethical as the uh, criminal justice system. I don't think there was any consensus. Okay. Like, I think that the, probably a majority of people were opposed to the use of machine learning for detention. Um, but there were there was a significant minority that took the other view and said, "Look, we just need to fix the bias in the data and the bias in the tools." Um, and you know, I'm going to confess, I found myself like I don't think I totally know the answer to that question. I think that that um, if you are if you take a a cautious approach to the deployment of artificial intelligence in high stakes settings, the answer is very clear. You should just, we have no business having used these tools to the extent that they're already deployed, and we have no business expanding that. Um, but wouldn't my advice be to say the administrators of a particular county in California who have a mandate under SB 10 be to, um, to you know, given that they've got that mandate, maybe there's a way that they can use the requirement to reduce incarceration in their jurisdiction if they're wise and careful about what they're doing. Um, probably I would advise, advise them to try from the inside. You know, if you've got this system being rolled out, try and use it in the 
the, the, the most de-incarcerated way possible. Um, in order to actually think it was a good idea, I think you would need to be doing things which nobody is, is doing, like um, setting these targets and saying, okay, we have to be done here. Mm -hmm. And then backing out and saying, is it really helpful to get us down here to use tools? Maybe there are other ways to get down there. Maybe the tools can help you set thresholds and targets um, to, to release more people. Okay, great. Well, um, that actually makes me think of another question, which is uh, what are the next steps and um, what is the, the way, um, is, is partnership on AI working on enforcement of like these uh, policy recommendations? Like how do they really touch uh, the system? So we have two things that we're considering doing. We have a committed to either of these. So one is just a transparency project to find out what, what on earth is happening. Because there are thousands of counties in the United States and many of them have purchased these, um, these pieces of software. Mm -hmm. Just finding out which software is in use where and how have all of these models been trained? Like what data have they been trained on? What if any corrections have been applied to them? Um, uh, what results are they producing statistically? Uh, and just getting a, um, a data set like that. So we're working, it's going to be our work with some people at Stanford on that question. And that may be really helpful for further reform efforts. If we know what's being used and where, and, and how those models were trained, we can go to the, the makers of those tools and say, okay, you need to fix this. You can't be using data from 2008 five or whatever to make decisions in 2019 and you haven't removed the marijuana arrests and you haven't applied a bias direction like just giving them a to-do list um, to try to reduce the damage that the things they've made is doing um, the other project that we're considering is to study that statistical question of how wrong is the arrest data it's very the, the, the errors in arrest data are very dependent on crime as well so Marijuana, marijuana arrests are extremely biased. Um, violent assault arrests appear to be a bit less biased. Um, so can we figure out how big that bias is, measure it, or is the answer actually the data is so bad, like go home and give up? Uh, so we might do a project on trying to assess that question uh, with some statisticians uh, to figure out, um, is that ba a basis for basically rejecting the use of all of these tools? Um, and was it ever hard to get the data? I mean, is it a difficulty to get the data? It's extremely hard to okay. get the data. Like, nobody is being transparent. Everyone's being extremely cagey. You don't have their data. Or it, it's astonishing. And of course, you know, you have to understand that the context of deployment is like court systems and police departments around the United States, which are really not technology forward institutions. Kind of go, imagine going in there and finding computers from the 90s or the 2000s and people who don't know what they're doing and people who also just you know, cook the books to get the, the numbers that they want in the out, like output end of the model sometimes. Um, no, no systematic record keeping, no systematic um, sort of accessibility of what's happening. And so actually another thing that we've been at least sort of trying to encourage toolmakers to think about is maybe there's an obligation if you use the tools to deposit the, the data somewhere. Um, that, so that we can study it. But there are no like uh, law or requirements around like transparency because like a judge, for instance, is under like a lot of scrutiny, right? Like from the law, uh, it's kind of stated. As Turns out judges don't like scrutiny that much. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the some of them do, but in general, you know, I think judges prefer it. Um, th th there are mechanisms of reporting. Judges can choose to publish cases, but they don't always do that. Well, may I explain why the system is uh, so bad? Um, okay, so I mean it's a really interesting, of course, like super important and interesting topic. And I was wondering, um, actually, Open Philanthropy has been giving a lot of grants uh, for prison reform, uh, and you know now the partnership on AI chose to work on this as their first first uh, report. Um, why now? Why do you think now? And why this topic? I mean, you know, besides the fact that it's an extremely important, urgent uh, issue. Well, I think that's that's the answer. Okay. Like, what, you know, when I took that job, I was like, oh, well, our state just passed this astonishing mandate, and the stakes are sixty-five thousand people in jail every night. 
uh, where an organization that exists to grapple with the ethical questions raised by these kinds of applications of technology. Okay, let's do this. Okay, great. Um, okay, I don't mean to be too controversial, but uh, there was something, some question that was like tickling me a little bit. Um, I think we can all agree that um, the problem of criminal justice doesn't um, threaten so much the business model of the organizations that the companies that founded uh, the partnership on AI. And so I was wondering if you know you or some other people <laughs> uh, might have foreseen a sort of limit there in what might be accomplished by the partnership on AI, you know, and the, the kind of issues that can be debated. What if we go, you know, and start like attacking algorithms that um, monetize attention for money? Um, yeah, that's that's what monetizing means. <laughs> um, and um, you know, surveillance um, and um, yeah, these kind of things. Um, what do you think? Uh, so I think the the the, the, the um People who founded the partnership on AI, who were the heads of the AI research labs at the companies, absolutely uh, like were signing up to like gaze hard in the mirror mm -hmm. and potentially have their companies criticized or at least called upon to think quite differently about profound questions, including trade offs like how does your business model entangle with uh, human well being. So I think it's a coincidence that the first topic that was on fire when we started spinning up staff to work on these questions um, happened to be one where none of our partners, to our knowledge, were literally selling these risk investments. <coughs> Though one of the company, one of the organizations that does make them, the Arnold Found Foundation, actually approached us immediately after issuing the report saying, actually, can we get involved somehow? Um, we'll see whether that's actually a good idea or not, whether we can help them improve the things that they're doing but um, I think we exist to hold AI to account wherever it's being used and that will include uh, lots of projects that uh, apply more directly uh, to the things that the big tech companies do. And what's cooking in the pot? Uh, so some of the things we've been talking about uh, include um, grappling with the question of when AI research should be published straight away and when there should be some kind of uh, process of uh, disclosing it cautiously, warning people if you've figured out a way of making synthetic fake videos or uh, finding vulnerabilities in software, what's the right approach to, to thinking about how you publish that and when and whether, whether you can forewarn people if there are potential unintended consequences. Um, We've been thinking about uh, synthetic media uh, in particular and what you do to spot if people are making fake videos that are completely fabricated, if they're propagating on social media platforms, how those platforms should respond to that, how do you label that for people. Um, we've been thinking about facial recognition as a, a, a technology that's beginning to be like widely sold. Uh, and whether that is appropriate to be widely sold and widely sold to governments. Um, uh, we've been thinking about emotional responsiveness uh, of AI systems and what types of emotional responses. This, this is still in the scoping phase, so we're not sure we're going to do that, but we're, we're certainly talking about it. Um, and uh, so we have a wide range of, of different topics. I think some of those are of that nature that will uh, cause our uh, partners to think more carefully about what they're doing. Very cool. We need to talk uh, because uh, we are working on synthetic media at Forsyth also. So, um, okay, another question. You mentioned Minority Report. Uh, is that the world we are moving towards? What do you think? Well, the difference between these things and Minority Report is that the prediction is really terrible here, right? It's like 60% accurate or something. Um, it's like almost like throwing like or um, dice down the stairs and saying, okay, like, wow, we get slightly better than random. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're not quite in that world yet, uh, but some of the philosophical problems arise anyway. Um, 
Yeah, but like in the recent news, actually there were like these three arrests. Um, I think this week of three persons who uh, posted, you know, about mass shootings and were you know sort of presenting signs of um, potential mass shooting. I think the first one uh, posted on Facebook that it was. Uh, interested in mass shooting, and the police came, and uh, it turned out he had a lot of um, <coughs> weapons that he was not supposed to have. Uh, the second one um, posted on Instagram about um, reinvestigating uh, uh, like a shooting in a Jewish center that had not happened yet, um, and uh, the third one I think was uh, through text. Uh, he texted someone about like his intention and he said, talking about the location, like three of them, and three the three of them were were arrested, right? Um, so I thought you know it's kind of interesting, and we don't really know, like, I mean we know we are sort of very accessible through our social media, through our digital devices. Um, we don't really know when we are watched or anything. And uh, yeah, I just think, I don't know, if you have thoughts on this or, I think, of course, you know, in this case, um, I'm, I assume that they are going to be um, tried on the accounts uh, of threatening, you know, threats or uh, illegal uh, ownership of some types of weapons and not on, you know, account of like murder. But, um, well, it's probably good policing to go and like pay a visit to people who are making public threats to commit some act of violence. Like if that's happening on social media and it's definitely a particular person, then going and paying a visit and seeing does this person look serious. That's not a uh, like a the wrong thing for police to be doing. Um, what's somewhat inevitable if you do lots of this is that you're going to start uh, knocking on the doors or kicking down the doors of some people who weren't actually uh, making those threats or who were making them uh, sarcastically or ironically and their words were misunderstood um, or eventually some people who uh, didn't actually make the threat and someone else posted it in their name or whatever <laughs> and so you just need to ensure that when you go when, when police go and knock on people's doors that they're actually paying attention and are uh, like not assuming that things that measure from a network of insecure computers are profound truths about the world. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's the whole sort of, you know, balance between like some type of, um, yeah, prevent good use of surveillance, like preventing some mass shooting and, you know, being able to talk to these people before they take any action, which is kind of really great, actually, um, for everyone involved. Um, and the 1994 uh, type scenario, or like uh, some form of civil mass surveillance, like in China. Um, okay, one last question before we have a little break and open the discussion to everyone. Um, I wanted to ask, to ask about uh, you and why did you decide to um, you know, go from uh, EFF to the partnership on AI and now uh, work on this. Do you think this is the most important issue right now or the most neglected? Like, what motivated your transition? Well, I think it's among the most important. I mean, in, in general, I think the artificial, the question of how humanity and artificial intelligence get along, if we're going to share our planet with a second and a third or fourth intelligent life form, is it going to be one we want to share the planet with? Those are really profound. Um, questions of our era. Uh, it's sort of astonishing. It's an astonishing privilege to get to work on them. If you want to plan for thinking about a future technology and how it's going to be used wisely, one of the best ways to start is to look at the preceding technologies and to ensure you, you're learning lessons and using those wisely. And that's <laughs> the, the lesson you see from, from this context in criminal justice is oh my god, when we're getting this horribly wrong these tools are not fit for the purpose they're being used for and they're being widely deployed across the United States and they're harming hundreds of thousands of people. How do we go back and start um, fixing the future by fixing the present? So 
uh, I think this is incredibly important. Like I wouldn't want to claim it's literally the most important thing in the planet, but it seems to be among them. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. <laughs>
Hello. Oh, thank you. Um, I was wondering because early on you were talking about reducing the sampling bias, and so I was wondering if you could speak more to that. Um, you dropped terms like you know conducting surveys, conducting maximum likelihood estimation. Like it, it might be too in the weeds, but if you could just speak more in a way that like how you would see doing that of like reducing that sampling bias. Sir. Um, we have a statistician who I hope will be joining us as a research fellow next year, who is the, the best person to give that uh, question to, and uh, she hasn't yet uh, totally finalized that, so I'll do my best uh, without being the, the person with the, the full vision here. But essentially, what you would try to do in such a project is conduct, create a generic simulation of the phenomenon of crime across the whole United States, which includes dealing with the variation in crime rates that necessarily occur in different cities, in different parts of cities, at <laughs> different times, and the different the variations. So, they, so you build that model. It's a very unconstrained model with a lot of free variables. And then you need to just build a second model of the process of measurement of crime and enforcement and policing. Um, and you'd see some crazy stuff there too, like, um, There are moments when rep crime reporting rates change really fast. You know, when something like Ferguson happens, suddenly you get communities that go from reporting crime at one rate to suddenly trusting police much less and crime reporting relative to actual crime plummets. And so you need to have a lot of free variables in your model to account for phenomena like that, or you need to admit that you can't account for them. And figure out how much error you expect as a result of that. But you might use something like, like a survey data set, like in the National Crime Victimization Survey, to try to get a hold of that. So that's a survey, that's a, it's a very large survey that's conducted, I think, every year that asks people about their experiences as victims of crime. So you start plugging in data from that second source there. And that also gives you a window into the demographic characteristics of the perpetrators of certain types of so crimes that have victims who are still alive uh, and who can see the perpetrator, you'll get some, um, some set of demographic characteristics from that data source. Um, and so you plug that in and it also has a certain level of statistical bias and statistical error, so you have to account for that. And then you might go for a third source of ground truth. Like um, there's a national youth survey that's conducted every 20 years that asks people in a, like a very extensive setting, it sort of samples very carefully, and then asks people a lot of questions about their lives, and asks them if they've done certain things or committed certain types of crime. And of course you'll get, again, a different set of answers with a different error rate and different types of bias. And then the magic thing would probably be to have a fourth source of data, which is something like the census but conducted, it was a very expensive source of data collected in a few sampled places where you go around and you knock on doors and you're really systematic and you ask people both questions about their victimization and their perpetration of, of different types of acts. And you, you look across these three or four columns of, of uh, you know, or paths to ground truth and say, well, are these things lining up with each other? If we believe the fourth source of data the most, a really intensive survey, what does it say about the error and bias in the three previous sets of data in different demographic and, um, uh, and com like community like settings around the United States? So you do something like that, and then you constrain your simulation model, you know, like as a maximum likelihood estimate for producing the outputs you're seeing across these four sets of data, and say oh, like what kinds of ground truth might have caused what we see in these four, um, uh, four data sets. And then we only have the really expensive systematic data in a few places, but we try to correct and do our reweighting using that ex very expensive data is the best closest to ground truth we've got, and then extrapolate the reweighting out to other places where you don't have it. So something like that. Uh, I'm doing a lot of hand waving because I'm not a statistician who should do this work, I'm a computer scientist. Um, uh, but uh, we, we may end up trying this and then seeing, does this come back and say, 
oh, the error bars are plus or minus 80%. Uh, or did it say, oh, actually, you can get like relatively good estimates of these phenomena. We, we don't know that until we do it. We'll try. It's green now. <laughs> well, that was great, thank you. Um, um, so I'm interested in making algorithms better, uh, but I also sort of see that as a version of less bad uh, rather than actively good. Uh, you know, so we, we maybe we could get less racist algorithms, but that's, we're still dealing with uh, punishing harm after it's happened, which is a big failure in my opinion. You know, like a win is prevention. Uh, and so I'm interested in this idea that you had in the end, which is that maybe we shouldn't be separating out criminal justice from social welfare. Um, and I, uh, to me, that seems very sensible. Uh, but uh, of course, we're up against the prison industrial complex, right? So. Uh, there are incentives to keep people in prison, and like we know that it costs about the same to send them to prison for a year as to send them to Harvard for a year. Um, uh, and so we could administer care really differently. Uh, and I don't, I guess my question is what do you think the barriers are? Do you think there's any way that we could actually use some of these uh, predictive algorithms to administer care in a more meaningful way? Um, and if if the uh, criminal justice system isn't going to do it, can we do it? Um, I think we should certainly try. We should certainly see, okay, if you go through an ethical design process for tools to recommend um, housing assistance better or mental health services better or um, tools to recommend, like, to assess the trade-off between criminal justice intervention and those other things, um, what could you build with the available data or what could you build with like a million dollars or ten million dollars or fifty million dollars of extra funding uh, both for the data and the interventions and then make the like do that design assessment and if it looks promising actually go and build something uh, I think there aren't enough people doing that kind of work and certainly not enough people doing it in the really systematic thoughtful way we were talking Uh, if we happen to have um, brilliant technologists, activists, talented intellects in our life who are um, feeling a bit disillusioned with the options that they might have available to make the world a better place, I'm curious how you might suggest they direct their talents or their money or their time or their social network uh, towards supporting the work that you're doing. I'm confused that the things that you're pointing at seem like incredible opportunities that very few people in my circle of thoughtful, caring people are paying attention to. So how can we direct people? What are our talking points? How do we get the right attention resource on these things? So one very generic piece of advice is if you want to do um, something like this, it's really good to go deep. So don't do it as a 20% time volunteer thing, but spend a lot of time learning about the domain and uh, commit to it for a while. Uh, so that you can understand both the underlying societal phenomena and then the technical stuff that's being laid over, laid over the top. Um, but when, once you do that, you're doing something rare and unusual, doing a combination of different um, of different things, and that means that there are a lot more opportunities. <laughs> you see something like high stakes harms that are happening that don't need to be happening, and an opportunity to go and learn about both sides of that equation and, and intervene. It's, and you're motivated to, it's probably really great uh, as a, um, a career direction for people to explore. And the skill sets you get will be relevant like, for a long time. Concrete, what should I tell people? As in like, where should they go to work? Yeah, like if they want to figure out what should they spend the next year of their lives doing, what should they spend 10 or $20,000 on? So we have a fellowship program at PEI. It's current, like currently a little bit, uh, we're about to reboot it for its second round. People could apply to our fellowship if they're relatively ready. There's an organization over in the mission called the Human Rights Data Analysis Group. Um, that's a great place to look at. Um, <clears throat> the ACLU sometimes hires technologists. Um, there are local criminal justice organizations, um, like if you're in the South Bay Silicon Valley Debug, um, SE Justice, Ella Baker Center. Uh, some of those are very non-technical organizations, and uh, but it might be really uh, like, good to go and spend some time with them. 
Um, I can give you a longer list. Wait, you can publish on your website. I'll be even more excited. <laughs> Um, yes, there is a question here. You talked about um, synthetic content, like uh, deep fake videos mm -hmm. and so on. Um, Photoshop has been around for quite a while. Um, how did, do you have any idea, any thoughts on how Photoshop affected the misinformation, um, the, the whole misinformation thing, and how that could be related to what we might see with fake videos and so on? So I think I lean a little bit more towards the view that we shouldn't look at the problem narrowly as synthetic misinformation. Um, the synthetic media misinformation, we should look at, look at it more broadly in terms of what categories of activity, you know, is it people posting satire that gets misinterpreted? Is it state actors with organizations with hundreds of people with a specific set of objectives? Um, you know, an office in St. Petersburg, or, you know, there are smaller versions of that that lots of countries around the world run. Um, or is it um, a political campaign by a bunch of uh, people organized on the internet who are basically applying search engine optimization to achieve some red pill social objective? Um, I think you want to start with that perspective and then get to the te technical questions a step or two later. Where you say, okay, how uh, how does like synthetic video become one more tool of this type of misinformation operation, and then how can we catch both of that and the other stuff that they are doing on technical platforms at the same time? So the meet the YouTube campaigns and the Reddit campaigns and the Facebook campaigns and the um, the Tumblr campaigns of these organizations will include a mixture of photoshopped content and uh, real photographs taken out of context and synthetic video and other types of content. And so we should look at that problem with all of those things together. Um, and you may want to just have really great flags from the synthetic stuff. So if you can do detection, spot a, a fake video, then that becomes a really loud signal that goes into a, a, a system that responds to all of these phenomena simultaneously. Yes? Yes? Oh, oh, sorry, I didn't see you. <laughs> sorry, I smell. Um, uh, more to, I think, um, something I was curious about, and I kind of heard this sort of repeated throughout the talk, um, but in, in different ways. Um, more of the preventative measures that we could be taking. Um, I sort of wonder about incentives, and certainly, Especially with the U.S. prison systems, we can, you know, all acknowledge that there are privatary fiduciary incentives to continue in the process that it exists now. And when I think about preventative measures, we could certainly talk about pressuring our government to stand up to this. And and I also think about a second part of this, which is um, it seems like a lot of these projects were short term. And they needed to have an end date and they needed to have a release date and then they didn't have a what do we do after we tested the data in real time practice and did we like have an opportunity to come back and re-alter our systems to try and accommodate for some of those errors right um, and part of that is they didn't have the funding to they were one-term projects they had to like get an end date out right so if we could put some sort of pressure on our government to actually pick up some of that um, funding uh, in a way that actually funded a longer term project. Do you see that as like an actual gain or, or am I just like blue boxing this whole thing? I think the thing that I would want from governments is probably they should, should, should not be mandating or purchasing these tools at this point in time. But if, they, if they're if they really committed to that, and in some cases policy processes are sort of it's a, a decision that's being made, um, they should be setting standards um, that are about meeting these requirements. And in, along the way, they will set one of those standards being the data has to be fresh. Um, and that may mean that there are literally no tools available on the market that meet that requirement. And so, I mean, I think if that's the case, you should stop deploying the tool, but there's another story, which is like, now there's a clear market incentive or need for philanthropic organizations to make <coughs> meet those requirements, um, one thing or the other.
Um, you had the question already, I didn't answer. So yeah, thanks again for the talk, it was great. Um, so I was wondering about uh, when you mentioned uh, about when having people mandate these tools, you might, in order to sort of alleviate some of the, the problems that they're having is sort of release in some accessible form some of the data that's been generated by these tools as a means of getting like better data to make the predictions better. Um, I was just wondering what you'd say about like given that this is super sensitive data um, related to people's like prison records, like all the demographic, like, demographic information, like even considering that it could be anonymized, if it was made accessible, there's a lot of, sort of stuff now about de-anonymization, getting, uh, like, basically using anonymized data to get basically targeted things on people, specific people. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more it about that. It depends on which of the tools you're talking about. So the things like the, um, the Arnold Foundation tool, which is, uses a much smaller set of variables, like almost, like, barely more than the one the, the example I had as a spreadsheet. Uh, I think for a, a data set like that, um, you could do an information theoretically robust um, de-anonymization. So uh, data release and, and be sure that the anonymization was watertight. Uh, for something like the North Point um, tool, which uh, has a lot more information about people, you would probably want to do either um, the data gets put in an enclave, like enclave somewhere, and people have to sign a lot of contracts before they get access to it, just promising not to de-anonymize. And or you could release a lot of statistics or do some kind of differentially private querying system. Um, and I think um, PEI and its partners, organizations like EFF would be motivated to work on, I think, that question about how do you facilitate appropriate data releases of data sets like this. Any more questions? We'll kind of follow up on his a little bit. Uh, being someone who actually has faced those risk assessments uh, inside, um, they, I, I, I kind of just tremble at a pre incarceration risk assessment. That would, that would be so scary. But uh, post incarceration risk assessments that they use are on two levels. And I think the data you could get, I think you could get that data. Uh, one is the first is most people in California, they have one of two types of sentences. They're determined or they're indeterminate. And if you're a determinate sentence, you're going home no matter what. So the risk assessment that you're talking about is used to determine what factors they need to re-enter society. So they, 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 do they need employment? Do they need uh, um, pro-social skills? Do they need education? And, and they, they start doing that and, and putting them into those programs and doing re-entry uh, stuff that gets them ready to be successful and then be integrated. On the other hand, the other side that are indeterminate, they still use that on, but the risk assessment doesn't mean shit. Because there's a human factor that comes in, the AI part is gone, and when they actually have to go before the board and, and Try to get out based on and, and, and throw out all this. They could have been rated the most minimum on that risk assessment there is and got all kinds of positive things that they've done. And the board, the human factor, still says no. So I believe that the, the information, the data on um, the post incarceration and stuff that you could get your hands on to the risk assessment for people coming out would be really positive, but the stuff that you would get from people that are maintained would be really negative. And I wasn't very clear about the scope of what we were writing about, so we focused on these pre-trial, so post-arrest, but pre-trial um, risk assessment tools that California just mandated. So they're essentially either recidivism or failure to appear predictions, but, um, and we, so we focused on that pre-trial case because that's what we had in California, but there are very similar things that get used for sentencing. So how long will you be in for? And also for um, probation decisions. Um, and so I, I actually would love to hear your stories if we have time to chat for a bit afterwards about what you were seeing. Um, because some of these issues apply definitely to sentencing, sentencing and probation. But if you view the tool more as like, what does a person need to ensure that their like life is going to go well once they're released? 
you shouldn't be using an algorithmic tool for that, but you should have a list of things to think about um, and variables to consider. It also, viewing it that way at the pretrial level would point towards the healthier direction. You've got a criminal defendant um, whose um, circumstances were really messed up for a bunch of reasons, and some of those reasons are under the control of the state. <laughs> then maybe the answer is rather than incarcerating them, <laughs> you pull the other levers you can pull to make their lives go a little better. You know, if they're, if they're dealing with like a huge number of parking tickets, which is often like a huge problem that people get in, in California, or if they're, they're homeless and you, you have housing, maybe those things are the better interventions than, than incarceration. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, I was actually going to ask something similar to what Zarina asked initially, but I'll adapt it based on uh, something you just mentioned. Uh, what would be the prospect of uh, taking this uh, analysis of effects of different sorts of interventions and moving it from an unanswered philosophical question to a requirement for these systems? It's a good question. Um, we did have one place where I think we, we sort of turned a philosophical question into a requirement, which was where we said you need to be honest and accurate about how your policy decisions get enacted in the school. So make a bunch of clear policy decisions, like you're trying to reduce incarceration, or you have a, your, your, your government has a particular stance on... Um, what the appropriate level of public safety risk is, like how much is if that jurisdiction is willing to tolerate in order to avoid the harm of incarceration. What if, make those choices, or if it's about sending a message, then actually think about what that really means and, and whether your tool reflects the policy choice that's being made. Uh, I think often those things might boil down to a risk assessment, oh, sorry, no, uh, to a cost benefit analysis of some kind. Um, so that was one place where we took something of that more nebulous nature and turned it into requirements. I don't know, like, what the answer would be for the others. Like, where are suggestions? Thanks. Cool. Um, hey, so, um, yeah. So you, yeah, great. Great presentation. Uh, it really has taught me a lot just in the last few days about uh, what's going on with these risk assessment tools. What clearly propose uh, to improve them? Um, are there any calls to action that you would recommend just for the general public? Whether it's uh, voting, is there anything upcoming in the political calendar? Is it spreading awareness? Uh, are there further educational resources that we should seek after? Um, that fit within our, our busy schedules and our variety of jobs? That's a great question. I'm going to say that I, my answer is I'm making it up as I go along, and I should probably have a better answer to this. Sure, go ahead. So I think find um, what look like well informed, community based, or scientifically based, or both community, like uh, uh, criminal justice organizations in. Um, your location and volunteer for them or donate to them. Um, donating to the HR uh, Human Rights Data Analysis Group or to Upturn seem like uh, good examples of that, or to Ella, Ella Baker or SE Justice, um, or to Silicon Valley Depot, these are local Bay Area organizations, um, or going to volunteer for them. Um, there will be a, like a, a ballot measure about SB10 that's on, on the ballot in 2020, how much it matters, we don't know yet. Uh, so I think there's work to be done by professional organizers to haggle over how high the stakes, given the, all the litigation that happens between now and then and the court decisions, does, it, does that ballot matter a huge amount? And if so, what, what's the strategic response to it? Um, and so that's gonna happen and then there'll be a conclusion and there probably will be campaigns to work on <laughs> once we figure out in like late 2020, which way is the right way to vote on, on that ballot. 
Um, in general, looking at candidates and saying a candidate's making like articulate, thoughtful commitments um, to reduce incarceration uh, mm -hmm. and voting for candidates that do. Thank you. Awesome. Um, is there one more burning question? Hi. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about that step between having a recommendation system in front of a judge and then a judge actually making a decision based on that recommendation. I think it goes off of your point really well that in some cases, mostly probably in confirmation bias cases, they'll say, I already thought that and this is a great recommendation. And then in other cases, when they've already made an alternative decision or there are other reasons, for example, it's going to be much worse if they let someone else and out and then they commit a crime than if they keep someone and they don't know the counterfactual that that person will never have committed a crime. Like that behavioral science step of understanding how judges are actually going to use the tools that are put in front of them. So this, you would think that there would be a lot of data about these psychological questions and people would be studying this and assessing like how good are these decisions, how are the decisions influenced by being given a number or a risk level. Um, but there isn't really good work that's been published uh, that I've seen. There may be some that we've missed uh, potentially, but um, and, and uh, I think the Arnold Foundation has said they're working on it, but it might be five years or something. Um, and so it feels like there's an important piece that's missing, which is assessing that decision-making process. But I also have an amazing anecdote. So we, uh, we had a dinner in Philadelphia recently with both the head of the public defender's office there and the DA in Philly. Um, Philly has elected a progressive DA and they'd both been like reading our report and it had some influence on their policy debate, which was amazing. Um, uh, but the DA told them an extraordinary story about um, a court ruling that had prohibited life sentences for juvenile defendants in Pennsylvania, or, or like in a Pennsylvania jurisdiction, it might have been in Philly specifically. And that had meant that they had a population of around 200 people who had life sentences without parole. So the worst of the worst, these are people who are viewed as like the most dangerous defendants, um, uh, the most irredeemable defendants, and they were required to release them. And it was statistically a very good data set because the ages of these people who were incarcerated were very varied. Some of them were still relatively young, others were, you know, whatever stage of their life had gotten old in prison. Uh, you know, age is a huge factor in crime, and so you have this, this incredible sort of release data set. And I think he said it was maybe five years already since that exper natural experiment had occurred, and there'd been one recidivism out of around 200 people. So even amongst this cohort, who human judges had assessed to be the most dangerous um, individuals, you've seen incredibly low recidivism rates. Um, and so, you know, we were a little bowled over by the story, so this needs to be told publicly. Um, and we're urging uh, people in, in, in Philly to write down that story in a sort of citable form so that people grappling with these questions in other places could have that um, information available to them. What was the age distribution of the two hundred that were released? It was pretty wide because, the, the, you know, there's a moment when there's a court ruling saying you can't... Yeah. 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 Good day, so. Yeah, fascinating. Okay, great. All yeah. right, one more. <laughs> Great. Hand Thanks for coming, Peter. So from a non-AI person, I thought you put it, made it very palatable, so thank you for that. Um, I have kind of a hypothetical. So we talk about a lot of the problem is because we're using old data or the algorithms using very old data that maybe aren't relevant now. So now what if the push is, let's get relevant data. If we get relevant data, we'll fix the algorithm, and then everything's good. But then what if getting all the relevant data Conclusively, 
What if it concludes that certain races have higher recidivism than others? Then do you abandon? Does that go out? You sort of abandon, let's go with the data route? Because then it goes against a lot of our social and ethical norms. Uh, sir, this is the way I would assess this question, is to say it's not going to be a race that has a higher or lower recidivism rate. It's, like it's, it's in a particular social setting, a particular set of life situations, which may be very correlated with race, that really cause uh, recidivism rates to be different. Um, and so a like crystal ball fair prediction could well, in fact, be um, disparate in how many people it assesses as high risk or low risk, depending on their ethnicity. But the important thing is to say, if you are not going to reoffend, if you're um, equally, you know, if you're, if, you're, if you're a person who, who is who was unlucky or something went wrong in your life and actually you're going to work hard and get your life back together again afterwards, your odds of being released shouldn't depend on the color of your skin if you're in that bucket. And so there's a certain notion of justice that is about that um, statisticians call it a false positive rate. The odds of being giving, given a false high risk rating and so I think if you level that, you won't totally level the predictions to make them equally uh, uh, equal numbers of high risk across different ethnicities, but you will, in a certain sense, be much fairer than the current system. Thank you. Amazing. Um, thank you so much, Peter. Uh,